school here in Missoula. Um, let's see, before that, I had did a short year in um, Fort Hall, Idaho, uh, teaching the same subjects. Um, I'm a UM graduate, uh, studied with Dr. Chin and others at UM. Um, proud Grizz here. Um, grew up in Pocatello, Idaho, largely. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, and very recent addition to the board, I guess, as most of you probably can tell. Anything well, else, Jesse? No, that's perfect. Okay. I think that gives everyone a little bit of understanding of the depth of your experiences and your perspectives. Um, so Matt, to start off, do we want to look at maybe the map um, or anything like that? And I can share my screen. How would you like to kick it off? Would that be good? Sure. Yeah, we could do that. Um, kind of give us a, a, an outline of what you're thinking. I have a, a little um, slideshow of, of the book in question with some questions built in if we want to run through that as well after you, after you, Bill. Perfect. Well, I'm going to bring up the map, but I feel like your perspective is much wider than mine in this domain. So if you just, I feel like one of the things that, um, and everyone, I'm a novice when it comes to Indigenous studies, Native American studies, but I have tried to take quite a few classes as I can at UM as I chip away at an MED in order to understand the perspective of some of the students that we're going to be working with here in writing coaches. And one of the really important pieces is the sense of place, right? This idea of understanding how culture is enmeshed with land and with ecosystem and with just history of a place, right? So one of the things that I realized was just a small way that I can try to keep that perspective regularly instead of just my personal cultural perspective is I have a map out in my office, which is our mud room now that we have a baby, but that's okay. Um, it's still a space where I can work um, that has tribal territories up on top of the towns that we currently know so that I just keep in mind that cross-cultural perspective of the state that we call Montana. So I thought it would be important if I just shared a similar map with you. And then Matt, if you just wanna let us know a little bit about how maybe that perspective can kick us off in understanding how our conversations are gonna to happen today. Does that work for you? Lovely. Yes. All right, so let me share my screen. <laughs> And then let's go over here. Is that big enough? Can everyone see this or should I make it bigger? Big? Okay, a little bit more. Okay, so as you can see here, um, I'll let Matt take over really, but I just, like I said, I think it's it's pretty different than some of the layering or geography or cultural perspective that we see in a Western perspective of Montana. And so I just think it's really important to think about place and space and sort of layers of history and perspective on the land that we live on, which is traditionally tribal territory. So um, Matt, anything that you'd wanna let people know about sort of this framework of understanding the space that we're working in? Um, no, I think that's that's, that's good. Um, uh, yeah. Just okay. Keep going out there. <laughs> no, that's great. Um, I think another thing, considering we're coaches, right, and we're talking constantly in languages the way that we're trying to help people understand themselves and articulate themselves, I think it's really great if as coaches we can, of course, note that English is not necessarily the only way that we can see the world and that some of our students are going to be seeing the world. So one of the things um, that I really appreciate down here is you have the English names of tribes, but then actually the tribes names in their own language, which of course is extremely important to consider. So I'm going to hand it over to Matt, who knows a lot more on this topic than I do. So thanks for letting me just jump in with my novice perspective. And I'll stop sharing, Matt, if you want to share your screen and take over with your slides. Okay, <clears throat> sounds good. Um, all right, yeah, uh, it, it's 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 interesting that you brought up that map. I think it's a good way to start out. Um, well, before I say anything, I just want to apologize to my, you know, elders and everyone in general for kind of speaking before people who have more experience than I. I'm just kind of sharing what I think I know. <clears throat> um, but uh, someone in leadership position recently this morning brought up to me that, you know, 
they know a little bit of Spanish and French, but they don't uh, know any native languages. And um, I, I think there's a perspective, a narrative shift that can happen when we kind of look at a map like that uh, and, you know, use Uncle Google uh, to ask um, Native American place names or something akin to that. <clears throat> Um, the first thing that popped up for me was uh, the list of states that have um, native indigenous inspired place names to them. Um, it's like half of them, like half of our states have, have, you know, native heritage language inspired names. And, you know, within each state, there's, you know, place names for the cities and whatnot. Um, <laughs> I, I think maybe... Um, that movie Wayne's World is more of a product of my generation and Cassie's, but there's a funny scene in there where Wayne and Garth uh, come upon um, Alice Cooper, who's supposed to be this, you know, hard rock guy. And he <laughs> enlightens them on like the place named Miliwake. It's a place of the indigenous people had uh, for the good place or something like that. And they're like, okay. <laughs> um, but uh, it, it's just a nod to like, place names and the prevalence there of yeah and, and and to just kind of back up and say that when we think about it uh we have a lot of indigenous words built into our lexicon indigenous words words from also all over the all over the globe and so it's stepping back to acknowledge that and honor that and really celebrate it and push it forward i think is a good idea so um let me, I guess, jump into this share screen thing. Host disabled participant, participant screen sharing. Um, and I'll um, share this PowerPoint with everyone. Sorry, one second. I didn't realize that I edited it to do that. So oh, let me okay. figure that out while you say something just brilliant or someone asks a question or something. Hold on one second. Okay. Um, so let's see, I guess uh, the, not me. I got my kiddo here, four-year-old hanging out. Um, let's see, uh, the purpose of this main text, Power in Place is again, showcase uh, this idea of how power and place kind of triangulates with personality. Um, and also to maybe give some food for thoughts on how um, perspectives uh, shifted over the past couple of hundred years and some of the influences um, affect our educational understandings, um, our goals, and how maybe we can walk some of that back and reframe some educational goals and understandings for, especially for indigenous communities, but for everyone really. Um, okay, so share screen. Okay. Can everyone see? Awesome. All right, uh, so rethinking approaches to uh, ways of knowing. Um, so I, I, a lot of these are um, um, quotes that I grabbed that we'll kind of walk through. We don't have to go through all of them, but hopefully they open up some ideas, some food for thoughts that we can uh, discuss later. Um, so uh, a, a big part of this book is um, discussing metaphysical concepts and how they might differ from culture to culture and how that translates to our educational goals, like I was saying. Um, so uh, the best description of Indian metaphysics was the realization that the world and all its possible experiences constituted a social reality, a fabric of life in which everything had the possibility of intimate knowing relationships because ultimately everything was related. I think that's kind of a message that most Indian country shares uh, that we're all related, things are related. Um, and, you know, once you get into, you know, Einstein and metaphysics and particle physics, thinking about the relatedness of things and connectedness, um, we start kind of seeing some uh, concepts we can build on, I think. Um, <clears throat> um, let's see. 
uh, Indian students are further are further misled by outrageous claims made by science, uh, which suggests that the various fields of inquiry, if taken together, represent the sum total of human knowledge. In fact, almost all of Western science is reductionist in nature and seeks to force natural experience and knowledge into predetermined categories that ultimately fail to describe or explain anything. It's kind of a broad statement, but um, as we kind of go forward in this book, the, they dissect the scientific um, process uh, that the Western world seems to really cultivate. Um, and I'm kind of, uh, I'll ask kind of maybe as we go forward to think about maybe substituting science for English literacy or um, language usage um, somewhat interchangeably. <clears throat> One of the most painful experiences for American Indian students is coming to conflict with the teachings of science that purport to explain phenomena already explained by tribal knowledge and tradition. So if you kind of think about this, how this experience plays out for some Native students, maybe some of you experienced this before, has, has your traditional or family understanding of something ever been challenged by a teacher or an authority figure in school? And what did that feel like? Um, we don't have to answer all of these out loud, but this is kind of, I think, what we're getting at. Um, like I said, uh, thinking about how we, this might be science and language interchangeably here. Um, it might be something as simple as like, well, my dad said that um, uh, the Easter Bunny is real, you know, and you know that's a small thing, but uh, maybe there's more worldviews built in that uh, that uh, got challenged in school, and it can be a process. It can be a thing, and so I think that's one thing to consider. Um, all right, uh, the current tendency of younger Indian scholars is to find where the tangents, the tangent points exist with Western science, and to proclaim, quite rightly, that Indians arrived at the same conclusions using a much different epistemology or metaphysics. Um, Indians use a peculiar way of maintaining a metaphysical stance that can best be ter termed as suspended judgment. People did not feel it obligatory that they reach a logical conclusion or that they could summarize the world of experience in a few words or sentences. Um, I picked this quote out because it kind of speaks to maybe sometimes the um, fundamental uh, conservation of words, um, the, the, the tendency for Native students to use as few words as possible um, to kind of avoid the idea of over-explaining when they don't know something or, uh, I don't know, it's kind of speaking bluntly about myself, like, opening my mouth about something I don't know, um, which could get myself into trouble or, um, yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, not only that, but um, when we're thinking about second language acquisition, there are fundamental ideas built into languages that can, you know, relate and 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 have some relation but perhaps the expression of that concept is is, is better vocalized or or even written in the the home or heritage language and and has a better um maybe better way of being explained in a heritage language um so opening up to the idea of concepts being rooted in the heritage languages, indigenous languages, stuff like that. Um, yeah, even I think thinking about modern or things we discuss and, and put in our lexicon every day, deja vu, you know, that's not necessarily a, a you know, English word per se, but it, it's, a, it's an idea we understand, it's built in and um, yeah. Western ideas have kind of caught up to maybe what it, yeah. Okay, moving on. 
If, uh, if the non-Indian or even Indian teacher or professor absolutely insists that a certain conclusion is true, remember the grievous sin of the Western mind, misplaced concreteness, the desire to absolutize what are but tenuous conclusions. Um, as we keep moving forward with our technolo technological improvements, we kind of often see that maybe one conclusion wasn't fundamentally complete and we have to revise our understandings and um, relying on that scientific basis for understanding can lead us to some incomplete understandings, I think is what we're looking at. Um, again, uh, Western science is not necessarily a form of unity and maybe even to uh, go back to this idea uh, of Western science and West English language uh, interchangeably, um, there are certainly some missing pieces from the English language. I think we as instructors have noted or some pieces that are just inconsistent that are hard to explain, um, you know, uh, yeah. <clears throat> um, so this quote is kind of the rationale for the book. Uh, this book is for teachers, parents, students, and leaders who recognize that something of great value exists in the quote, old ways. We must not romanticize the past. Everything was not perfect. But if we want to truly exercise self-determination, there is no better place to start than with an effort to give our children an inheritance. Too many generations of American Indians were outright denied or have struggled mightily to maintain identity within tribal cultures we were actively engaged in, as opposed to existence within a culture of indoctrination facilitated most effectively through US government education programs. The first task can be accomplished by articulating the main features of the Western tradition and then counterposing, counterposing the key features of American Indian or indigenous North American metaphysics. For example, most of science continues to reduce reality to a physical world. Consequently, knowledge itself becomes reduced to generalizable principles by which atoms, genes, or things appear to act. In spite of new research in the areas of ecology, complexity, the phenomenon of chaos, the process of emergence, and much of cutting edge physics, science is taught in most schools as reductionist in terms of what counts as reality, knowledge, and the appropriate methods for acquiring knowledge. Um, so maybe this kind of reminded me of just some of the statements that uh, we hear in Indian country. Um, uh, creator has his ways, uh, you know, um, kind of thinking about how um, we really have to remain humble in the in the work of creation or however you want to categorize it, call it, and that everything is very unpredictable. And when we think things are going one way, they can take a total 180. And um, our, our ability to understand or predict any of that is beyond us. And, and, um, trying to use the scientific method or language in general to categorize it all is, uh, it's the work of some, but um, we'll never be fully encompassing of what we feel and experience as people. You know, we can talk about what we see, touch, taste, et cetera, but there's more to it that seems and uh, acknowledging that and recognizing that is something something that doesn't often happen in school, I think. So maybe that's part of the point. Um, so maybe some things to um, think about. Um, how can you as a coach uh, person encourage your exploration, exploration of these uh, uh, understandings? Um, I kind of ramble on, so if I if you want to stop me for questions or comments, please do at some points. Uh, again, we're kind of getting used to this uh, this format, so I don't want to totally monopolize the time. Yeah, folks can raise their hands virtually if they have a question or a comment that they want to jump in with, and then I can call on them. I'll 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 watch. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. Chris, I see your <laughs> hand up. Um. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, I'm intrigued by something you said a few minutes ago that there are uh, indigenous ideas that the English language doesn't even have words to express. And it, um, I'm hearing the, I, the, the thrust of Western science to categorize everything and sort of separate it in this category and that category. Can you, can you say a little bit more about the wholeness or the concepts related to that, that we don't as English speakers necessarily express very well? Mm. <clears throat> um, the one thing that pops into my mind for, you know, primary English speakers is if you look at German, they seem to have very interesting concepts that are built into very long words uh, that are almost a sentence onto themselves. But it's, um, to think about indigenous ways of knowing, um, uh, some, some languages have this idea of animacy built in, um, in that everything's alive and has a kind of energy or spirit or something. And that affects how sentences are structured. The most, if you look up the idea of animacy, you'll find this in Wikipedia and the, there's an example with Diné or Navajo. Um, people are a little more animate than say a donkey. And so uh, a donkey can't kick a person, but a person allows themselves to be kicked by a donkey. That worldview just, you know, it, um, uh, a friend show, shared me with, the, with me in Blackfeet, in the Blackfeet language, um, the, the term for horse is, you know, one thing, but if you say my horse, that's a very different sounding and looking word because of the like fundamental relationship um, of that person and that thing. Um, so uh, th those are some things, I guess, to kind of speak to that. Thank you. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, and I had a question. Sure. Um, just in rough numbers, um, in a, as we look forward to, um, to coaching more uh, American Indian students, how many of those students would have English as a second language as opposed to a primary language? Oh, good question. Um, not many, probably in the single digits. However, um, there's a, you know, kind of a very significant phenomenon of um, the fallout from boarding schools, I guess. Um, as we kind of are all aware, most uh, most communities were subject to that experience, boarding schools, day schools, residential schools. They were taught English, that was the goal, but um, the number of people in those communities who reach the status of proficient English speakers is very low, you know? Um, so uh, they in turn went back to their communities. They were not proficient English speakers at home. Yada, yada, a few generations later, we have communities without proficient speakers per se in the academic sense, but they function on a community level. They, they're all understood. Um, they get by and, you know, it's not a problem. It's a, it's, it's a thing. Um, so when they get into school, often they do tend, some of them, some of them fall into the category of English language learner, though they don't, they're not proficient in their heritage language and they're not proficient in English, but that's all that, you know, and, it, and in that, la that label, that's kind of embarrassing, you know, it can be. Um, discouraging to be an English language learner, but I'm, I'm American. I've only lived here. It's a whole thing. Um, so being mindful of that, I think. Uh, thank you for bringing that up, and I'm glad you, like, yeah, remembered to mention that. Does that help? Um, yeah. Thanks very much. Sure. Any more? 
Um, so getting to kind of some of the hearts or the meat of the book, um, let's see, uh, whoops. Uh, traditional American Indian cultural practices act actively acknowledge and engage the, the power that permeates the many persons of the earth and places recognized as sacred, not by human proclamation or declaration, but by experience in those places. And those will be probably evident in the stories that are passed on and such. Um, but as we kind of move on, think about maybe to yourself, the places that are significant to you not just in Montana, all over the globe, whatever, however that translates to you and, and, and the significance, the meaning and the power of maybe sharing some of that, what that could be and um, how you could evoke that from a student, I guess. At the heart of power in place is a suggestion that before we all become specialized mechanics of different aspects of the phenomenal so-called objective world, we seriously explore and attempt to recollect a way of knowing where interpretation or meaning subjective is integrated in the realm or reality of experience. Western science resolves itself into certain laws that describe the natural world. These laws are makeshift descriptions of the manner in which physical reality appears to operate, but they're often regarded by Western scientists as invaluable. <laughs> Phenomena that out, fall outside the prescribed patterns of behavior are said to be anomalies, which can be disregarded when explaining how the physical universe functions. Um, and again, kind of back up, I, if we're going to talk about language, um, <laughs> English is just, it, it, it seems like such a hodgepodge of other languages thrown in that it's, it's really hard to describe to someone all the different rules and exceptions, um, the I before E thing, science. Um, here's the diphthongs that make E eat or beat or beat or threat, you, you know, and um, trying to map that out, uh, it's difficult. <laughs> um, so maybe taking a step back and, and not pretending that it's uh, an absolute science, this English language. Uh, is helpful to some who are trying to catch up and learn all the conventions and without all the exposure. Um, so thinking to yourself, how would you boost confidence in writing? Um, think about some techniques. Um, there were no anomalies because Indians retained the ability to wonder at the behavior of nature. And they remembered even the most abstruse things with the hope that one day the relationship of these things to existing knowledge would become clear. Um, yeah, I guess just that humbleness of like a lot of stories, traditional stories just kind of end some, sometimes. It's like, and that's all I know, you know? It doesn't have to be like, and the moral of the story is, um, uh, yeah, that knowledge base can kind of just be there and without total resolution and just kind of trusting that you have it and it'll it'll be there when you need it. And I think, I don't know, however that translates to writing, I think maybe some students kind of leave their ideas open-ended and, and don't get to that conclusion piece and maybe need help, I guess, in that academic realm, perhaps. Indians as a rule did not try to bring existing bits of knowledge into categories and rubrics that can be used to do further investigation and experimentation with nature. The Indian system requires a prodigious memory and a willingness to remain humble in spite of one's great knowledge. Um, it is much easier in discussing Indian principles to put these basic ideas into a simple equation. Power and place produce personality. I'll just minimize this. Um, this equation simply means that the universe is alive, but it also contains with it the very important suggestion that the universe is personal and therefore must be approached in a personal manner. And this insight holds true because Indians are interested in the particular which of necessity must be personal and incapable of expansion and projection to hold true universally. 
The personal nature of the universe demands that each and every entity in it seek and sustain personal relationships. Here, the Indian theory of relativity is much more comprehensive than the corresponding theory articulated by Einstein and his fellow scientists. The broader Indian idea of rel relationship in a universe that is very personal and particular suggests that all relationships have a moral content. For that reason, Indian knowledge of the universe was never separated from other sacred knowledge about ultimate spiritual realities. Um, so I guess this was kind of just speaking to that idea in action. Um, we still have uh, ceremonies for, for salmon, green corn dances, et cetera, that kind of acknowledge um, our functioning relationship uh, to space and creation and th this ongoing thing, um, which is, I guess, just helpful to tap into, I guess, because I, I don't know, maybe some students just aren't sure of what their talents are that they can bring out in their writing, but um, assuring them that they have uh, a relationship, a talent that they can share, um, giving them that courage that, you know, we're, we're interested because we know that your interest will translate to like deeper meaning, that kind of thing, I guess. Um, so just kind of maybe pause and if maybe anyone else has questions at this moment, um, thinking about some of these questions for a minute, uh, which ways of re which ways of knowing resonate with you? How do you know these ways of knowing within yourself? What are some places you feel are powerful? Uh, what are some places you want to go? Kind of maybe it's kind of an extension of that question. Um, and why? Um, what places fill your cup? What do you feel when you're in a comfortable place, home? What are some of your first memories of Missoula or wherever you live? Um, I think uh, maybe just kind of throw things out there. A lot of people who visit concentration camps without, you know, you know, really engaging with things up close can kind of feel the power of that place. Um, and, and other other places kind of have that feeling as well, I, I would venture. Um, maybe on a lighter note, um, you like sports or concerts. If you go to like Madison Square Garden, you're like, oh my gosh, Led Zeppelin was here in 70, whatever. Um, you know, uh, that, that kind of creates a, a, a significant thing and it's hard to divorce um, place and time, I guess, in that sense. And it's, it's a good thing to celebrate. Um, and not only that, but uh, it'd be, uh, a good thing to encourage people to um, celebrate the stories that, you know, have been here for hundreds of years. Um, yeah. Matt, I just wanted to hop in and thank you for prompting us with these questions, because I feel like in the context of sort of potentially cross-cultural perspectives while we're coaching or worldviews, um, these kind of questions remind us that what we might take for granted as our cultural sacred space isn't necessarily the same space that students share. Maybe there's some overlap, maybe there isn't. But I always love when folks who might not think about these things, um, like I wouldn't think about this on a daily basis, are prompted to because it, it helps us reflect, okay, here are my answers, but here are how, of course, other people's answers are going to be quite different and how that means when I'm having an interaction, especially when I'm the one who's quote empowered in the situation as a coach, um, understanding that we might not share the same reality, right? With the student that I'm talking to, whether they're indigenous or not, there might be different variables in their identity that allow them to have a different perspective than me. And like you said, I think the most important thing that we can do as a coach is remain humble in what we don't know, and then be grateful when students share with us their reality so that we can have that exchange as as equal humans versus a top down. Um, so I just want to thank for the prompting. I think this is lovely. Yeah. Sure, sure. Um, and maybe thinking about how you would answer some of these and like the confidence that brings out in your answer 
translates to some of the students who don't have a confident answer when they're sharing some story or some idea on paper really kind of maybe nudge them to like, think about where you're from, what stories do you know of, what do you, what places and, and, and spaces and people do you celebrate? And if you, you know, dig into that, you have some really great material and we're all here to listen because, you know, we all have great experiences to share. Um, so, yeah. Okay. I think I have a little bit more. Um, I think Chris had a question. Chris, oh. did you want to hop in? Yeah. Yeah, I'm, you know, and I'm, I'm thinking about what you said about the worldview and the how so much is relational and then contrasting that with Western knowledge, you know, this is, this is in this category, this is in this category. So much of what we emphasize in coaching is critical thinking and you know we're we're look we're often looking at essays where they've had to take a stand and sort of prove a point with reasons is that kind of a foreign um approach to the to native kids i mean it does is it does it become too rational and sort of science-based to ask that that be done are, are they going to be more effective at storytelling or or can't you generalize? I hate to generalize, but I do personally and maybe do kind of hear in other people's message that it is kind of foreign. Um, it's not it's not undoable, but it almost just seems like after so much explaining, what's the point? <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, you know, um, I don't know. There, there, some things can get, you know, just over rationalized, rationalized to death. And um, yeah, uh, I, I, I guess, yeah, kind of speaking back to that humbleness of knowledge. Um, some people might not give you every bit of knowledge about that particular concept that they have. For fear of or for like economy of ideas, for fear of not being correct, um, yeah, I I would just say um, you know use your discretion with I don't know it'd be good to, to help walk them through that bit I think because that I think it is a significant bit to like Thank get you. that conclusion piece nail it down of like here's the bits of logic that you're using to defend your argument say them say them again please so we all hear and those kind of bits are a little foreign i think so could use help with writing good things to keep in mind thanks matt and then jane also has a question jane do you want to go ahead um this this has made me think in kind of a heartening way of a book I read some years ago called The Feminine Face of God, in which three researchers interviewed 450 women about how they came to know of a higher power. And for the most part, um, I forget the percentages, but they, they said outside through nature. You know, there was a girl who hid under the house to get away from her brothers. And under there, she discovered such a sense of calm and peace in which she felt, she felt it was a way to come to know herself, that, um, that it, it remained with her profoundly, that sense and that feeling. So I don't know, I, I just wonder if there's a deeper way that we connect if we just ever take time to, you know, direct ourselves toward it yeah yeah i think maybe my response to that would be i think that just touches in touches taps into like the innate connections and stuff that you know all humanity really has um but that uh have endured on this land up until 100 some years ago um 
but ever, that everyone can still tap back, back into. It's just a kind of a natural thing. I was listening to the radio this morning and the DJs were like, new Stanford study says that walking in the woods for 20 minutes decreases heart rate. I'm like, yeah, 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 we know, we know. <laughs> How is this Harvard study, Stanford? You guys spent all this money to find that out. Um, uh but and, and, and i guess to see how that can help our students um reminding them that 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 knowledge that understanding is fundamental within them and that if they want to tap back into that to help them understand the bigger pictures and make connections and relations that could be a functionally good thing uh, a, a, a tool to help them get through a topic um, that's maybe bigger in concept. Yeah. And Matt, I, oh, sorry. I think Beverly has a question, but real quick, I just want to plug this one. If you guys can see it, thunderous. Sorry, mm -hmm. my background's fuzzy, but <laughs> I'll send you a picture of it. Um, it's a graphic novel written technically for middle grade students. But I think that it can really help us as coaches, instead of approaching this and saying, hey, this is just for kids, which um, is true to a point, but not necessarily. How is it through pictures and through only spoken word, right? In the way that there's bubbles, sort of like in a comic. Um, how can that help us see the relationship differently between characters, um, especially because this one talks about relationship between humans and animals and sense of place and land. How can we approach that type of literature from a different cultural perspective, right? Instead of saying top down, oh, that's for kids or something like that. You know, even the types of literature that we engage in, the types of ways that we tell story can be perceived cross-culturally and through different lenses. So I just, it would encourage folks to access our lending library and kind of try to look at it from a different perspective instead of just absorbing information, trying to see it from a new lens. And then I think that Beverly's trying to raise her hand. So go ahead, Beverly, and unmute. <laughs> I can't find my hand button wherever it is. Um, I wanted to thank you, Matt, for your thoughtfulness about um, the question about persuasion versus argumentation. Um, I, that some people say, oh, they're synonyms, they're, they're really the same, but I, I see them as different. And so with the National Assessment of Educational Progress uh, for the writing assessment, uh, we landed on the word persuasion because persuasion I think is a more culturally inclusive and can be a gentler term because um, one can tell story um, to be persuasive and, and gentle about it or specific. But when we moved to Common Core State Standards, a different group of people made their cases <laughs> argumentatively. And so Common Core um, decided to use the word argument and argumentative writing. And I think it speaks directly, Matt, to what we are here today to, to discuss and to learn from with you um, is that words do make a difference. And they're interpreted then by us as educators or as members of the public, community members. And then they get translated into assessment. And this has huge implications for how um, we, we work with our young people, how we coach, how we communicate in oral language and in written language. So I, I really appreciate um, the question about persuasion and argument because that's how we will be thinking about working with our are people in the schools and, and educators in terms of how um, narrow, if you will, or broad, how inclusive or restrictive uh, the writing or the oral communication or the storytelling or the graphic novels <laughs> may be. So I, I just wanted to say thank you, Matt. Um, this is important both right here and now for us as coaches, but also it has implications for our larger national and state educational system. So um, I think there's a difference between persuasion and argumentation. Um, so just again, thank you. Thanks, yeah, totally great insight. Jane, did you have a follow-up? 
maybe your hand was just still raised from earlier, Jane. Is that the case? <clears throat> um, so I guess if no one else has anything right now, um, I know we only have a few minutes left. Uh, I have a few more book recommendations, kind of get some food for thought out there about place-based ideas that are not just super into this like metaphysical breakdown, whatever. Um, Braiding Sweetgrass is a very well received in the last year or so. Um, I think every local bookstore has a copy. Uh, and I believe there's a PDF copy if you want to search around Google. Uh, there's a free copy uh, PDF. Um, but it does, it, it's kind of like chicken soup for the soul. There's small little stories, personal stories of discovery of on this path of like language revitalization for the author or, or connecting back with the land. And it, it kind of personally, it's it, a lot of the stories have kind of informed a lot of my um, parenting um, ideology, I guess, uh, as, as the author describes how she, um, you know, went about uh, modifying her life as, as she brought a young one in, up and stuff. So that, that's a good one. And, and yeah, it, it has a lot of very direct place-based um, stories. And I think they're, they're, they're shorter and they're, they're very digestible. Um, Fool's Crow, I think most of you are aware of a very Montana-centric book that takes place in several locations around um, and in, in times, I guess. Uh, it's a very good one. It's kind of a denser one, but um, if you... Um, I don't know if there were a book to like focus on place-based Montana, that's one of them. Um, they're there, like, as we mentioned earlier is a good one. I like it because it does speak to um, the city as a place, uh, Oakland in particular. Um, not a lot of um, native literature focuses on urban, uh, urban Indians and, and how they, come to find a city how did they how they define it as home think of it as home and what that means to their identity etc it's, it's very kind of it's got layers to it and I really appreciate it for that for that respect um not only that but there's instances of the of using kind of broken English in there and kind of the character is examining what that means to their identity to say in it like a like a person who typically from the plains. Um, Thunderous is another good recommendation, like we mentioned. Um, I just, uh, during the James Welch Fest, uh, listened to this author who's from the Seattle area, Sasha LaPointe, who's Coastal Salish. Um, she has a um, autobiography, I think, uh, called Red Paint. Yeah. And uh, I haven't read it yet, but I'm really, really interested. She, uh, her story is about how she, was growing up uh, in the reservation area around uh, Seattle, um, not very wealthy family, but very interested in what's going on in Seattle as far as the punk scene and music and whatnot. So she she hike or she hitchhikes and get bums rides and and walks to Seattle to go to go to these um, you know inner city punk things and and there's you know on the surface it's like. You know, there's there's some conflict there of like an indigenous identity and a punk identity, but you know there's some overlap and so it's a good identity read, point a place significant place. Um, my last one, and this is kind of for for the grownups. <clears throat> um, this guy named Stephen Graham Jones, he's Blackfeet. Um, he's kind of the native Stephen King, if you will. That's kind of reductive, but. Um, there's this good one, The Only Good Indians. I read that one, it was thrilling. Uh, these guys uh, who are Blackfeet go hunting up on the reservation where only the elders are supposed to hunt. And in doing so, they set off a chain of events that leads to one of the deer seeking revenge on that group of people. Um, my Heart is a Chainsaw. I'm a hundred pages into this one so far. It's really great. Uh, it takes place in Northern Idaho. Um, a young lady who is very fascinated by all the slasher movies of the 80s and 70s and 90s, all of them, starts seeing 
uh, suspicious things happen. And she's like, oh my gosh, I'm in a slasher. I'm in a slasher. Oh my gosh. It gets really excited. It's very fun. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, those are some recommendations, some ideas. Um, so if all else, I would say, encourage people to think about place, the stories of place, what they know about places and people. And um, we all have good stories to evoke from there. And um, not only that, I guess, just kind of um, thinking about uh, with our knowledge base, what we consider possible and worth sharing and, and stuff like that, and maybe how that kind of seems different. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Matt. This sure is thing. enriching and just a lifetime of journeying into this is just wonderful. And I, I think that's what's so great about coaching, right? We're part of a lifelong learning community where we're always trying to grow and then demonstrate that skill set to our students. So thank you everyone for attending and for being willing to take part in discussions that help push us past our specific cultural location so that we can be better supporters of all students. So I'd love to hear from anyone, any other perspectives, takes on the reading, questions for Matt um, before we decide to finish it up and eat some dinner or whatever else we might do tonight. Anyone else wanna jump in? Well, there's a lot to think about. So maybe just mull on it, right? And then, you know, this conversation does not need to end, please. The whole point of this is we're building on this. We want to share this with other coaches. We recorded tonight and um, we'll definitely share it with our coaching community of folks who couldn't be here. Um, Matt, thank you so much. We are so thrilled that you joined our board and um, have this expertise to share. I just, I think it's only going to make everything that we do richer, um, so I'm, I'm really excited. And like I said, we have a lending library now we're really growing as an organization. So, um, it is never a burden, please obviously use your local libraries because we love those as institutions, but get a hold of us if you need a copy of any of these, um, and please make recommendations. And, um, usually everyone's just so busy during the fall season that we just do one meetup. So this is our one for now, but we'll probably, um, have two in the spring just because sometimes, you know, we can catch our breath after the holidays. And if you have recommendations about topics that you think would help enrich us as coaches or guest speakers that you think could be really interesting to bring in, please let us know. Um, as you know, it runs the gamut of what you might coach on, of the different approaches teachers are taking, of the positions that students are going to take on their topics. So the sky's the limit, which is what's so fun about what we do. So thank you, thank you, thank you, Matt. What a wonderful evening. And please just consider this the beginning of, of thought processes on everything here. We really appreciate all of you and keep growing with us. We we thank you so much. All right. <laughs> Thanks, thank everyone. You, Matt. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Take care. Have a great evening, everyone. That was wonderful. Wasn't it? Let me just stop that was recording here. Wonderful.